Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the panel Towards a Digital Bill of Rights, the launch of the Initiate Digital Rights in Society process. This event is the start of a process aiming at pioneering a possible digital Bill of Rights. It will establish working groups co-chaired by representatives of government and civil society. Those working groups will identify within a year's time possible points of consensus and compromise in developing this bill. My name is Martin Tisney. I work as Managing Director at Luminate, a global philanthropic organization, part of the Emiliar Group, and I specialize on issues of data and digital rights. I'll be moderating this panel, and it is my pleasure this morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on your location, to present the members of our panel. Nanjira Sambuli, who is a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. Nanjira Sambuli is a researcher, policy analyst, and advocacy strategist who works to understand the intersection of ICT adoption with governance, media, entrepreneurship, and culture. Welcome, Nanjira. Lafa Reddy, who is the co chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Lafa Reddy served as an Indian diplomat from 1975 to 2011. She was then appointed as the Deputy National Security Advisor from 2011 to 2013. Welcome, Lafa. Craig Newmark, Thank you. who is the founder of Craigslist and Craig Newmark Philanthropies. Craig Newmark Philanthropies protects values such as fairness, respect and opportunity and supports people who are effective fighting for those values. Welcome, Craig. Natanya Sweeney is Professor and Faculty Dean at Harvard University. She is former Chief Technology Officer at the US Federal Trade Commission. Professor Sweeney pioneered the field known as data privacy, launched the emerging area known as algorithmic fairness, and her work is explicitly cited in government regulations worldwide. Welcome, Latanya. A few brief words from me to open us up. Digital rights are huge, a timely, a challenging topic. Digital rights can be seen as an extension of human rights in the digital era. They include, but aren't limited to, freedom of association, assembly, expression, opinion, access rights online. And they also include data rights found in data protection laws, such as the right to be informed, the right of access and rectification of erasure. They respond to challenging problems which pre-exist but are made worse by the quantification of our societies, polarization, hate speech, disinformation, and also algorithmic bias, discrimination, and injustice. These are global problems, but the fact is that until recently, many of the norms and standards to solve these problems, such as the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR in the European Union, were codified in the global north. There have been many exciting developments in the Global South, such as in India with the recent data protection law, and even more recently the non-personal data framework. Here, I might draw a parallel to the open government and open data movements, which strengthened their roots in the Global South and North over the past 20 years, making very clear that innovation comes from everywhere, seeking inspiration and examples from laws and practices from Indonesia to Brazil, from South Africa to Norway, and then codified these in norms such as the International Open Data Charter. So for our panel today, we'll start with questions around the nature of the problem to hand, in part, but not only, the challenges I just mentioned, and then go to potential solutions and interrogate the role of a potential digital Bill of Rights. I'm going to ask each panelist a minimum of two questions and kindly ask them to speak for no more than five, minute, five minutes in their answers and very much encourage a lively debate. We'll end with a Q&A, and I'd like to inform viewers that they can use the live chat on the platform throughout the whole session to send questions. So my first question is to Latanya Sweeney. Latanya, how different, in your view, are digital challenges experienced around the world? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's, a one, it's wonderful to be here and to participate in this important event. Um, you know, technology design is the new policy maker and data is the new currency. The design of technology determines the rules that we govern our lives, our daily lives. And we don't elect technology designers and we don't even know their names, but the arbitrary decisions they make and the designs they create determine the rules that govern our daily life. At present, um, a lot of the technology designs are American oriented. But because, and that's because so many of the first wave of technology companies came from the United States. But their interpretation of American values are not the values worldwide and not even American. 
Each group and country has to translate the technology to that society. Data being the new currency, you know, who holds the data gains power and control. So different countries have to figure out their own data economy and who they'll trust. Thank you very much. So given your points in terms of different countries needing to, to figure it out, I'm interested then to turn to, to you, Lafa, from an Indian perspective. What, what do you think these challenges look like from the point of view of the Global South and specifically focusing on India? Uh, thank you, thank you, Martin. I'd say, Martin, that from my point of view, uh, the challenges of the Global South are really a lot of challenges. Uh, let me begin by saying the first challenge is inclusion, because we need to connect the unconnected. We need to, uh, you know, we now have approximately 4 billion people connected, but we still have 3 billion people who are unconnected. And most of them are from the th global south. We obviously need more digital infrastructure and connectivity uh, in the global south. How, how to improve this situation with limited resources is the challenge I think that faces most global south countries. Uh, the affordability of devices and data in the absence of adequate income is the third big challenge. Uh, the fourth challenge I would say is how secure are the systems being used in the global south, both the hardware and the software? And how do you then get digital literacy out to a large number of countries where some of the population or many of the population are not literate. Uh, I think then you come to the question of when you have this sort of a mixed situation in a developing country, what do you do about privacy of data and protection of data? Many of these users really do not understand how valuable their data is and how, what is the concept of privacy of data. You take a family in a rural setting with very limited resources. One person has a smartphone and the whole family is using it. The, everybody has access to all the data on the phone. They all use a common uh, password. Uh, you know, I think these are situations which perhaps people in developed countries don't have to face. So these are specific challenges for the global south. I think then from the point of view of capacity building in all these areas, uh, huge resources are going to be needed. In some cases, countries can allocate some part of their resources or a large part of their resources. In other cases, they cannot. So is the world going to step forward and help those who need this kind of uh, assistance to, to reach this goal? Are we going to have an equally connected world? The next point I would say is, how are you going to give an adequate voice to the global south in international fora where policy issues like internet governance, standard settings and new technologies like artificial intelligence, 3D printing, robotics, quantum computing, the internet of things uh, are being debated. Uh, obviously, the, the debate right now is mainly from the point of view of developed countries. But what are the thoughts of the global south on these issues? I think we really need to take a look at this. And finally, for the global south, I'd say a big challenge is how do we use ICT devices and ICT platforms for empowerment and to reach sustainable development goals? This, this for me, is a summing up of what it is in the global south. Uh, I can give a few more examples from uh, India. 
but uh, I would, uh, you know, respect the time limit. So, Martin, if you want to hear some specific examples, I'm happy to do so. I think hearing a specific example from India would be fascinating. The examples are really what, what brings these issues to life. I'm very struck by your example of um, many users not understanding how valuable their data is and that one person in the family may be the only person of a smartphone that's shared when so many of the policies around data protection are focused around an individual Right, a very individual understanding of what data and data protection is, and you're talking about a more collective understanding. So perhaps another example from India would be fascinating. Well, you know, India is a very unique uh, case in many ways. You know, in some ways, we're a highly advanced and competent IT power, uh, but in terms of per capita income, it's certainly a developing country uh, needing much more resources, affordable access for the underprivileged, as I mentioned. We're the second most connected country in the world after China, and yet we are the country that needs to connect the most people. It's a conundrum because we have half a billion people who are yet to be connected. Uh, it's a, the largest democracy in the world. But the requirements to ensure effectively both physical and digital rights of every individual is a struggle uh, in the context of several complex social constructs of a, a multi-religious, multi-ethnic society with social attitudes ranging from the medieval to ultra-modern, depending on whether the individual is in an urban or a modern milieu and whether the ecosystem in which they live and work is conservative and restrictive or supportive and enlightened. So, you know, I think that India is a very unique case in that sense. And that's why I brought it up. Thank you so much. We look forward to going back into those examples in more detail. Um, Craig, I will turn to you next. We've been talking about the, the, the nature of the challenges in the global north as well as in the global south. And when it comes to disinformation, it seems it's one of these challenges which permeates so many different countries, from the United States on one hand to Myanmar on the other. So I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts. What do you see as the link between disinformation and the business model of the major digital media platforms such as Facebook, Google? <clears throat> Yeah. So the, the media platforms, the social media platforms are advertising platforms and that advertising is driven by engagement and engagement is driven by the most uh, inflammatory or engaging materials that people can produce and bad actors throughout the world are finding that have learned how to create inflammatory disinformation which generates greater and greater amounts of engagement. The solution for this seems to be to, well, there's two parts. One, over time, there's the hope that uh, machine learning platforms may be able to identify and trace flows of disinformation. That's a, uh, a future. It's an exciting future in a sense, but it won't help us right now. In the near term, the solution may, may lie in finding the greatest super spreaders of disinformation and then finding ways to slow them down, to limit them, and sometimes to do what disinformation researchers call pre-bunking, which is to say, to first stop the, uh, well, to first fact check the information which is beginning to flow from disinformation sources. We're seeing a dramatic example of that play out in the US at this moment, where the directors of the uh, of Homeland Security, CISA, Cybersecurity Infrastructure, are being very, very careful to point out flows of disinformation aimed at destabilizing the voting process in the US, which itself aims to destabilize US democracy and democracy everywhere. So the problem is with the business models of the social media platforms. The near-term solution might be to find low-hanging fruit, just slow down, limit the super spreaders of disinformation, 
and there's the beginning of a solution there. Unfortunately, in the case that I mentioned, the example, the individual doing that may not be long in his job. It's just very interesting. It strikes me that um, what you describe this this dichotomy between on one hand the near term so limiting the super spreaders and then in the medium to longer term the problem being with the business model in some ways it's a little like the symptom and the cause i don't know if you would agree with that analogy that this information is a symptom but the business model is a cause does, does that ring with you that's a that's a large part of it the business model is problematic in that it recur it, re it rewards engagement even if the engagement is very, very destructive. Hmm. And, and, and do you the, see, sorry. Well, the solution lies again in limiting uh, super spreaders. There then the problem becomes political since the worst of the super spreaders have the greatest uh, national engagement, although that may come to an end in the near future. Thank you. I'm very keen. That's I'm going to turn to that's very helpful. I'm going to turn to Nanjira Sambuli right now, and I'd be love to have the views of the whole panel as we move forward on this on this question here, and the degree to which you all think that well, the degree to which digital and data rights may, in the medium to long term, be a curb on the impact of that business model, which Craig, as you described, being around advertising driven by engagement, which itself is driven by that most inflammatory material. Um, but while we're still talking about the nature of the problem, so thank you so much, Craig. Um, turning to, to you, Nanjira, do existing digital rights frameworks, in your view, apply equally in the global south and north, given that, as we've discussed, they were predominantly developed in, by and for the global north? And, and, and what do you think we can learn from that? No, uh, existing digital rights don't apply equally. The global south is still often an afterthought, if at all a consideration in the frameworks designed primarily here for Europe and the US, which is still perceived as the center of the world. So we in the global south are typically expected to merely consent to and align with what is essentially an imposition of a digital universalism from the global north. We see this in how the processes of conceptualization and deliberations for said frameworks are conducted. Uh, representative stakeholder groups from the South are hardly involved at each critical stage. Then at the adopt adoption stage is where a country or organization from the South might be called upon to endorse a pre-cooked or fully cooked solution, what I'll call representation as a band-aid. So this myopia in the digital rights space does follow from existing critiques of international human rights instruments, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was developed at a time when most countries of the South were barely at the table to deliberate and contribute to the universalization of the instrument. So what we can learn from this is that we have a long way to go in designing, implementing, and enforcing international or global frameworks for a digital age, legally binding or not, that are accommodating of the diverse perspectives and realities from across the world. For example, and we've already started alluding to this, prevailing digital rights frameworks center on individual rights. Yes, yet most value in the digital economy is accrued from combining individuals data with other data sets and creating group data. Now, you and I are individuals within the digital economy insofar as we're classified within groups which are based on unaccountable assumptions and predictions, be it by race, gender, geolocation, socioeconomic status, or etc. So we're then confronted with the limits of focusing on the individual as if their perceived autonomy is sufficient for their digital rights protection. It also influences norms that place the burden on individuals to bear the responsibility of protecting their digital rights, such as to online privacy, where the onus is on them or on us really to opt in or out of terms and conditions, services and such. Now, if deliberately diverse consultations on what should comprise digital rights were conducted, we can learn, from, for instance, from the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which is perhaps the only human rights instrument that attempts to comprehensively unify the conflicting notions of community and individual rights and introduces the concepts of duties to balance out these rights. For us, the now popular concept of Ubuntu still prevails. I am because you are. 
It encapsulates duties and obligations along with the rights enshrined for individuals who are a part of the people and communities. And this is very much the challenge we're grappling with in digital rights. Now, to be clear, this should not be taken as a mad rush to discover other cultures and regions' perspectives by the same actors presently running the show. But let's discuss this when we revisit the question of inclusion. Thank you. I, I love this point. I have to say, I'm, I'm always so struck by the degree to which, um, just, you know, as you said, the, the so, so many of the rights are prevailed and centred around the individual. So much of the legislation, the regulation is focused on the individual. But then Craig was talking about the business model. The value from a business perspective lies in group data. So it sometimes feels to me that there's a game of smoke and mirrors being played here. But just to follow up on, on, on your point around the African Charter on human and people's rights, and you mentioned very briefly the concept of duties and the concept of Ubuntu there. Do, do you want to just maybe explain that and unpack that for, for the panel and our listeners? We'd love to know more. Sure. I think what we're seeing with most uh, instruments that talk about human rights against entering the individual is, as somebody has written, we don't have a matching uh, instrument on the Universal Declaration of Obligations or Duties to balance those rights. So we end up with what seems as human rights instruments that are signals. But the African Charter was deliberately designed to understand how the African people conceive of an individual as part of the community. So my rights are only valid are only valid insofar as I bear and consider my obligations as well to my communities. So, for example, if I use the app Truecaller, which is very popular in these parts of the world to, to you know, get a sense of who's dialing my phone, if I'm not clear on the fact that if I upload, if I actually download the app, it takes all my contact information. So if any of you are not uh, willing or consenting to use the Truecaller app, I have exposed you as my community to an application that is harnessing your data and now has you on the radar, whether or not you were trying to be on that radar. If we were using obligations and this understanding of group rights, we would have a very different framing on how we legislate uh, or regulate uh, applications like those. Such a, such a fascinating concept. Thank you so much, Nanjira. Um, I look forward to coming back to it. Um, before we move on to questions about solutions, if I may, um, Latanya, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I was just wondering if you had any, any responses you'd like to make. It strikes me that Nanjira's points there around the very specific culture and values which informed the African Charter on human people's rights, this such a strong point around, you know, my rights are only valid in so far as I consider my obligations to my community, communities, to repeat what you said, to paraphrase you, Nanjira. Like, how, how does that resonate with you, Latanya, given your points around that the, the tech design bakes in policies and how these need to be different? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you have any thoughts to this. No, no I mean, it comes down to a matter of trust. Who is it that you're really going to trust? And this is, uh, and this changes as we go from country to country. You know, do I trust the government or do I trust companies more? And, you know, uh, and this point about obligation is very, very powerful because societies that trust their community more or even their government more will make very different decisions about how the lens on which they put on these rights and obligations uh, than a, a, a country or a group that really values, say, individual autonomy. I mean, in some countries, the idea of anonymity is not one of empowerment, but is one of isolation, that you're not a part of a group, that you're not a part of a community. And yet in the, in the entire, in a global notion of technology, all of these differences have to be figured out if we're going to have a Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you. Such a rich conversation. I'm going to um, move us to, to the part of our conversation talking about some of the solutions, because I feel that we've naturally been going um, in this direction in the flow of the conversation. Um, Latha, I'm, I would like to turn to you at this point. How do you think it's possible to build capacity in the global south to exercise these digital rights? Many of your earlier points had to do with this issue of capacity. What, what do you think about that? You know, I, I would say, first of all, uh, Martin, that uh, we have to be uh, very clear on who we want to involve in this process, because 
I feel a multi-stakeholder process is essential. You know, when I was in government, I actually uh, set up the first uh, joint working group between government and the private sector in India, where we talked about what we could do together. Uh, I think that needs to be widened still further. We all talk about multi-stakeholderism, but I don't think we really practice it to the extent it should be practiced. You need to bring in the think tanks and academia where you have an enormous amount of uh, talent. You need to uh, have governments be more transparent on the regulations they're considering. Uh, I think it has been done. You know, I recall when we had the new telecom policy and we had the earlier cyber security policy of 2013 in India and this year a new policy is coming out. Uh, they were put online and everybody was free. Every single citizen was free to send in their comments and their suggestions. Obviously, not all could be adopted, but I think a fair number were considered seriously and the draft agreement was amended. So I think these are good practices for building capacity towards people understanding their rights. But not only rights, I think as one of the previous speakers said, there's also a question of what are your responsibilities? You know, shouldn't uh, the private sector, especially the major platforms, be held accountable? Uh, you know, if there is misinformation uh, being uh, spread or vulnerabilities which they're not disclosing to the users. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, the governments need to be transparent on surveillance. And I think in each of these sectors, you need to build this concept that rights are important. Because if you don't do that, you know, people are going to think that it's okay to just make the money, move on, make the regulations and people will obey. Uh, but that's not really the way a, 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 a just society works. That's not the way people's rights are respected. So uh, my suggestion is you need to build capacity in each of these sectors, each of these stakeholders, in order to enable them to play a meaningful part when you talk about rights. You know, when we talked about the aim, really, of uh, uh, what we're trying to do here, uh, you know, the goal is that uh, civil society should be able to hold uh, you know, the dominant business and political interests accountable and pave the way for a new digital social contract or an, or an international bill of rights. So if you are not informed, you cannot influence. And if you are, if you, you know, if you are not informed, you cannot act. So I think to get everybody together to talk about these different points of view is very, very important to my way of thinking. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. If I may just ask you a follow up on that. Um, you, you mentioned and we've been talking about the notion of rights as well as responsibilities. And, and in talking about responsibilities, you spoke about accountability and the need to hold platforms accountable, accountable if there's misinformation being spread. Do you, do you see the notion of responsibility also extending be, beyond those powerful actors, beyond the platforms and governments having to be accountable? What does responsibility look like for the individual, for the families that we were talking about earlier? Or is it really a question of accountability primarily? Well, I can tell you in India right now, a lot of individuals are being held accountable. Uh, several people have been arrested for things that they're put out on social media. Some people are serving jail sentences, some are out on bail. Uh, so certainly the individual is also held responsible. It's not only platforms that are held responsible. Uh, so I think it's happening. In practice, it is happening that individuals are being held responsible. And if they are seen as violating the rights of another, uh, whether by saying something that offends them or by 
you know, this is a very, very touchy subject because you're talking about the freedom of expression, you're talking about the freedom of speech, uh, and each government has its own way of dealing with that. So my only point would be that individuals are responsible. In fact, that's one of the tenets of the Global Commission. If you read our principles, they are we have responsibility as one of the principles. And that means everybody is responsible. It doesn't mean only the private sector is responsible or companies are responsible. Everyone has a responsibility within their specific sphere of action. Thank you. That's, it strikes me as a really helpful and important point as we pursue this conversation. Um, Latanya Sweeney, Professor Sweeney, I'm, I'm tempted to come back to you as well. Um, you, you discussed and you made these points that norms are dependent on, on who you trust, right? Who are willing to be transparent to. And as such, they change quite dramatically from region to region, from country to country. You were giving the example just earlier about how in some countries, anonymity might mean isolation and, and not be a positive thing. And in other countries, it might be a good thing. And I was just wondering if we could unpack that. It seems to me to be such an important topic um, for this process. You know, you were making the points earlier that societies who trust their communities more will make very different decisions versus a country that really values individual autonomy. I think just talking about, from your experience, some of those countries, I mean, as you said, the tech design comes from the United States. The United States is a place that really very much values individual autonomy. Nigeria, you were talking about the African Charter. I don't mean to generalize about um, African countries, certainly a number of African countries, as you mentioned, valuing community alongside individual individual rights. I'm just wondering if there were some other examples, Professor Sweeney, that might be helpful to bring to the fore here. Well, I, I don't, I, I defer to the panelists who I think have fantastic examples from the Global South, and I would certainly defer to them um, for, for that, but in terms of responding to those examples, I mean, when we think about human rights from the United Nations, for example, basic tenants like life, liberty, and security clearly hold, but how exactly are they gonna get interpreted and instantiated in data and technology? That's where the unpacking and the translation occurs. Um, and I do think this issue about the rights of the individual versus their responsibility to the group is, is a are the fundamental questions that surround that. I don't think this is the first time this issue has come up. I do think that the United Nations uh, and other human rights groups have had to deal with this on an ongoing basis. But I do think that's the plight that this uh, route will take as we talk about data and I and the and the examples are just already have been fantastic you know this tension of the individual versus society comes really down to how we org have organized these countries and then you, when we add in the economic layer which the technology companies often represent then the comp then the issue of their business model I think is is really dominant so you end up with these three kinds of stakeholders. I mean, the most transparent, I would just say as an example, just to be quite transparent to everyone, is that if you have a government that you can trust, then you don't mind giving your data to the government because you believe, because there, you believe that the right kinds of checks and balances exist. On the other hand, if you have a distrust of the government because they actually can threaten your lib life and liberty, then you have a very different view. And, that, and the tension is also a tension of surveillance versus autonomy, you know, even to the point of if I'm so responsible for my community and where does my individual voice come in? So these are natural tensions that exist in these societies that the societies have defined for themselves. How exactly will technology get translated that way into them? Thank, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, I'll turn back to you, um, Nanjira Sambuli. We were, you know, in talking about collective rights and talking about group data, one of the areas, and I've done some research on the topic, is that I'm, I'm struck that most people or many people agree that the harms that are felt by communities, and Professor Sweeney, you were one of the first, if not the first, to highlight these, the harms that befall communities from data-driven interventions are often group harms. They're felt at the group level. Um, it seems to me a lot of people agree about that. But then when it comes to the rights and the solutions, 
we fall back to individual rights. That articulation of what the collective and group rights is strikes me as as, as hugely important. So, so Nanjira, just those those topics. Would love to get your view on it as as well as the the point about inclusion that you made earlier. So, obviously, inclusion is key to these digital rights themselves, but also the process to develop them, which is in some ways like you know we're seeing this live in the conversation right now. So. What do we mean by inclusion um, from your perspective? And if you also have any thoughts about, you know, further on in practice, what these collective rights look like, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I must first preface the whole idea of group rights and how it's really playing out is actually also a question of power. Um, the whole idea of the group rights and harms that are affecting groups will always uh, more often fall on those who are marginalized. And that's something we must keep in mind. And very closely related to that is our um, what we say versus what we mean in practice when we talk about inclusion. Because most talk of it is very well intentioned, but the point of departure is in the follow up in the implementation and enforcement of uh, inclusion principles and roadmaps, of which there are a dime a dozen. Uh, at Professor Sweeney already alluded to this, but it's true that in tech design and development, in tech reform, in tech policy and governance discourses, we have a crisis of tech bros, which has been mentioned before. So urban white males are disproportionately influential across this spectrum of shaping and realizing our digital rights. And as Professor Sweeney put it very brilliantly, tech design is the new policymaker. These are still the folks, the tech bros that is, who get the lion's share of resources. They are the ones drawing the scarce attention to their ideas on how to solve things. We're basically fashioning our global digital futures in the image of a dangerously unrepresentative sample. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI as they're called, are still these nice to haves, even though we know they're foundationally needed across the board. The political and moral will to realize them is still very weak. True inclusion is deeply difficult and uncomfortable work. It means for many having to step back and not being the savior, the one with all the answers, the one who's always automatically called upon to fix things or has a right to fix things. It essentially entails decentering Europe and US really as the default axis of the international. And this is an urgent task if we're going to get international or universal instruments for the digital age and get them right. True inclusion requires us to necessarily slow down, and this has come up as well, even in a very fast-paced digital order. It recalls upon us to ask reflective questions, to test every assumption, to account for who's not in the room, in the deliberations, and why, and as well as how to correct for that before this, these groups are entirely overlooked. And again, these are usually groups. Now, it's a moral imperative to address the issue of inclusion and to address it right. For too long, it's been a talking point, yet praxis shows us that we have a very long way to go. In the meantime, uh, as you've alluded to, Martin, real life consequences of this lack of inclusion across the spectrum of innovation, policymaking, and everything in between is translating to serious harms, particularly for the most excluded, who in this configuration are in groups and identities for that matter. Now, inclusion, to be clear, is not just about uh, of Global South uh, perspectives and knowledge, but very much about its people as drivers of these process, uh, processes that will shape our digital presence and future. Thank you so much, Nanjir. I, I, I couldn't agree more with your points, and they are fabulously well put. I'm wondering, from your perspective and your experience, have you seen this done well in other settings? What, what are the lessons that we can learn from perhaps completely different settings, right? Working around, could it be around climate change? Could it be around environmental degradation, protection of cultural rights or others? Have you seen this done well? I'm thinking of this process that's kicking off now. Are there examples that we can use usefully? I don't know about done well, but done in a way that uh, surely seems to have brought enough <laughs> actors to the table. And in this case, being member states, I think is the deliberation or what ended up being the sustainable development goal. You hear that it was a very slow process. For most people, slow means bureaucratic, but every, I think many views, as diverse views as possible from different sectors were inco uh, incorporated to these goals, the 17 goals that we use as uh, uh, global goals now. And I think we need to, recall, to go back to that kind of process. And especially now in a world where different stakeholder groups are res responsible for such different paradigms and not just in the traditional way, governments had a very specific role, companies had a specific role. We're seeing this hybrid and so we have to figure it out, but I think we have to allow the latitude of time to do it right. Um, even though we feel the pressure of get, getting it done as soon as possible. 
Mm. That's a great point. Thank you. We'll come back to that, looking at the SDGs as a, as a potential example. Um, Craig, Craig Newmark, I'd like to come to you now to talk about the role for the philanthropic world. So from your perspective at Craig Newmark Philanthropies, what role do you think the philanthropic world should have and possibly also not have in pushing these conversations forwards? What opportunities do you see? Well, I'm kind of an amateur uh, philanthropist and I'm very aware of the, uh, the vastness of my ignorance in these matters. So the model I've developed, which could be uh, become more widespread, is to realize uh, how little I know in the US and across the world of what underserved populations actually need. So instead of trying to be the uh, savior of underserved populations, what I do is take what limited uh, power I have in the form of influence or money and then find groups who are effective in some areas and then to give away whatever influence or uh, money I might have available for that. So in the areas of uh, at least of individual rights or digital rights as perceived in the US and Europe, I support the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, when it comes to, oh, when it comes to uh, media, community media, ethnic media in the US, of which I'm totally ignorant, I've located groups like the Black Media Initiative at the City University of New York and the folks at the Howard University uh, Journalism School and then just shared what resources I have there. So in all these areas, the idea is to identify, well, instead of having a, a single centralized organization hoping to save underserved populations, my approach has been to give away what I have to the organizations who actually are the underserved populations, and then they can figure out how best to address their needs and their rights. Part of my job then is to get out of their way while still ensuring that they actually are accomplishing anything. So my variety of philanthropy is to empower the groups who I hope to serve and then to be the opposite of a uh, savior type. Thank you so much. And I can see how that approach is extremely well, extremely well suited and, and fits well with the model that we've been talking about earlier of inclusivity as mentioned by, by Nanjira. Um, as we move forward, I'm going to turn in a second to questions from the audience. I'm starting to get some questions in right now. Um, before we do that, I would I would love to ask sort of one question really to, to all of you. So I'm not entirely sure how the technology will work. I think it might be sort of first come first served in terms of who jumps in. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really curious for your views and, and for all of you. Um, how does a digital bill of rights or how might a digital bill of rights serve people who've been excluded across different regions? We've come back to this topic in different ways um, throughout this conversation. And I would, I would love to have thoughts from the panel who, who might like to start on that. Uh, I'll jump, uh, maybe I'll jump I in. Oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Latanya, after you. Okay. Well, all I'm gonna do is clarify the problem. <laughs> uh, in particular, <laughs> I would just say that uh, on the one hand, sort of following up on Craig's model of the, the savior, on the one hand, having a bill of digital rights can offer protection to those who are incredibly vulnerable. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand um, a bill of rights can actually push away and, and run against the values and norms of the society. So that seems to me a natural tension that's come up here. That's a great point. Thank you so much. Um, and and Lata, Lata Reddy, you were also going to jump in? Yeah, I just had a wild thought, you know, and that are you going to say that uh, digital rights are a fundamental right? Is that is that what we're going to say if we eventually come out with a digital build of rights? Because in a sense, uh, that if it's adopted by enough governments, would make it imperative to connect everybody. 
and uh, and to give them easy and affordable uh, access. Uh, the the other thing I think about serving people who've been excluded is how do you use local languages? You know, English for a long time was the main language of the internet, and uh, now in India we have content in 22 languages, and the growth. Right now, the number of people using Indian languages is larger than the number of people using English, and the growth rate is larger. So the question of language content, I think, also empowers people mm. enormously. Mm. Hugely helpful. Thank you. Offer. Yeah, Please. I'd offer that we might need to also consider sharpening the question and ask, does a bit of digital bill of rights serve the people who have been excluded? And the onus is on us to say how and why. I mean, we, we can assume that, you know, just declaring an instrument is this new Magna Carta, but we know that we've been dealing with this since um, the last, you know, decade on new instruments and new, new conventions, you name it. And we have to find a way to think about how the extension, especially in the language of rights, is translated for how rights are being enjoyed and respected in a, what has previously been an analog world. So, so if I may, Nanjira, I'll then turn your question back to you and I'll weave in a question <laughs> from the audience. So we had a question from the audience for Nanjira Sambuli saying, Nanjira, you made such an interesting point on the algorithmic classification of people into groups and the prevalence of group data. How could the concept of groups be integrated into the Bill of Rights? That may be part of it. Um, it's up to you. And turning the question back to you. So a digital Bill of Rights serving people yeah. have been excluded. How? Why? What, what, what do you think would work? Maybe not even, let me use a very specific group, a category of people, and this would be children. Uh, what specific rights we have for children who are not yet in the, you know, what we call the age of consent and who are coming online. And especially during the season, we've seen schooling, working, they're doing PE from, from online and that data is being collected. But they're still in, uh, you know, in their formative years, they still have all these rights enshrined in the Convention of the Rights of a Child that should essentially translate to the fact that a child, the data collected about a child today should not determine the kinds of services or uh, algorithmic categorizations that they'll be formed into. Because you're essentially saying a company, a government is creating an identity for them before they've decided for themselves. And I think children uh, as a specific group group, if you will, as a very important group to consider, because if we can get consensus on that, we might be able to start figuring out how to deal with other groups of people who have been um, excluded before we even get to the politics of who to prioritize. But I think we can use the idea of what, what are the rights of children in the digital age, including the right to opt out as everything is digitalizing as an example to keep in mind for what we're talking about here. Such a great point. Uh, such a great point, and, and, and I'm going to get this, I think, slightly wrong, to which I apologize, but my understanding is that different digital media platforms at times use different ages to define when an individual, when a person is or isn't a child. I believe, for example, Facebook may use a different definition than other digital media platforms. I don't know if others on the panel, Craig or others, would like to come in on this issue of, of children specifically. I would just say that this is a fantastic example, the example of children, um, and because it also goes right back to Craig's earlier point about the economics of these businesses and the fact that uh, and how, to what extent do we are they allowed to opt out or are they co coerced into wanting to participate because there's no real option for them. I, ju I just think it's a fantastic example. I agree very much. Um, Craig, is there anything that, that, that you would like to, to contribute on this? On the overall, also just the, the broader question in terms of how a digital bill of rights might serve people who've been excluded. Um, in terms of actual philanthropy right now, I'm engaged in uh, two funding efforts. Primarily, uh, well, the, the issue that they circulate around is that of uh, data ethics. Again, reflecting my uh, ignorance of so many of these uh, matters. At the University of San Francisco, there's the Center for Applied Data Ethics, which looks at issues, for example, uh, facial recognition and problems of algorithmic bias. And that center is, well, it includes people from uh, multiple areas across the world, realizing that this 
North American centric uh, perspective is not universally true. So the intent is to explore what the ethical issues are because those are problems in the here and now. And then in other respects, work with people who are facing issues of inclusivity oh, and uh, bills of rights, work with people who are facing them, those issues right now. For example, I'm a heavy funder of Reporters Without Borders. You'll see me attempt not to attempt to pronounce that in French, but right now, Reporters Without Borders, based in France, is now in the process of publishing rights and responsibilities relating to the press. That's uh, another step in trying to harmonize the perception, uh, perceptions uh, and responsibilities of news media across the world. So again, the theme is, for at least for philanthropists, is to admit our ignorance, turn a lot of this over to people across the world who seem to be effective and then get out of their way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig Newmark. Um, I'm going to come back to a question from the viewers, from the audience here, before coming back to our last question for the, for the entire panel. Um, Natanya Sweeney, Professor Sweeney, I have a question from, for you, from, a, from an audience member, a viewer. Um, the question is as follows. Professor Sweeney mentioned data protection as a priority in digital rights. Data is also the backbone for AI research, since AI models learn on data. How can we achieve more ethical AI through data regulation? And also, should we distinguish between AI applications built on personal and non-personal data? Well, I think this is a, a great question from, from the audience because uh, just so to level set the conversation, uh, as we think about what, what what's the next big boom in technology or big area, it's it comes from having massive amounts of data who can use those to learn different kinds of artificial intelligence basically in order to bring forward better ai we need tons and large amounts of data so the question is how it brings us to this question of the data economy where is this data going to come from is it going to be is it is it going to be coerced out of individuals through the use of services is it going to be something that somebody pays for? Is it going to be something that the community says they own and therefore individuals contribute it to? Around the world right now, this conversation is taking place and all of those examples are being, are, are being pursued. Um, and I, and it's, it's just so fundamental, even to something like manufacturing, where the next generation of AI and manufacturing requires large amounts of data. How are we going to put that data together? And the groups that can begin to answer those questions may have an economic advantage. So I don't answer the question by pretending I have a solution. I can only say that it's a fantastic question and that many of us are really working on different ways of thinking about it. And, uh, and we'll see how each of the different ways begin to converge. Thank you so oh, much. Can I just say, can I just say one yes. other thing too? And that was the question also kind of embedded a way the world has worked. It embedded in that question was, well, what about data protection? The idea embedded at first glance is the idea that the individual needs to be protected. And in some settings and some kinds of data, that may be the case. But what's the nature of that protection to take is exactly falls into the conversation we're having now. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and in hearing the answer to that question, I'm reminded also left already of the points that you started out with talking about, you know, communities, people in India, not necessarily being aware or having the literacy to think about what is the value of the data that I'm engaging with, whether it's the data in that mobile phone that you mentioned earlier, that one mobile phone for, for a family. So as I, as, um, as we, end in the last sort of five or six minutes of our, of our great conversation here. I have a question for, for, for all of you. I might first turn to you, um, Rafa Reddy, if that's, if that's okay. What do you see as the role of different actors in this process, civil society, government, business? Rafa, you talked about the importance of multi-stakeholder process, your experience in bringing the private sector to the table. Um, like, what can we learn? So I guess I might actually 
go a bit further in the question, what's the role of different actors in the process? And from your experience, the four of you, what can we learn from what you think has worked previously? Nigeria, you made an earlier point about the SDGs. Latha first, perhaps, if that's okay. What, what do you think? Uh, well, Martin, um, you know, I, I was thinking about that question. You know, when you talk about uh, civil society, uh, let's say we're talking about, uh, you have to split it into different areas, right? You have to talk about uh, the users who could range from people who have very simple connectivity needs to uh, very sophisticated users who have need quantum computing. Uh, you could also bring in think tanks into civil society because they make a lot of the out of the box recommendations and thinking that perhaps governments can't make. Uh, and you have to bring in academia and all the research uh, and innovation that's going on in academia. So civil society itself is, is multiple levels. Uh, the second category you mentioned about government, again, you know, you, you're talking about the central government, you're talking about state governments, you're talking about city governments, you're talking about local governments, and there is a need to educate at every level, because ultimately, if I here in Bangalore am a victim of a cyber fraud, it's no use to me to go to the central government in Delhi and complain. I have to find out where's the cyber police station with a trained person who can help me right here in Bangalore. And therefore, that sort of grassroots level uh, government uh, facility needs to be there, apart from the higher levels. And there has to be a huge system of coordination between the grassroots level, the city level, the state level, and eventually the, the, the union level, if you like. Um, similarly, in businesses, you're going to be talking about the micro sector, you know, the tiny sector where, you know, I'm part of a microfinance uh, setup where we give very small loans, maybe uh, less than a, less than $500 to somebody to set up a vegetable kiosk or a tailoring uh, kiosk uh, so that they don't have to sell from home. Uh, you have all the new businesses that are going into e-commerce now because of COVID. You have the small business, you have the medium-sized business, you have very huge businesses who have different requirements. So, uh, you know, I think it's a very, very multi-pronged approach and you have to have separate approaches for, for each of these uh, uh, sectors. Uh, and finally, you know, I, I would say there's no... There's no easy solution. There's no one magic bullet. There's uh, not one solution. There will always be multiple solutions because we're dealing with multiple people at multiple levels. Thank you so much, Latha, for these points. Um, we have another two minutes for the panel. I believe that by the nature of this being, you know, wonderful panel online, this digital panel will all get kicked out automatically within two minutes. So I'd like to take this opportunity just to remind all of us and our viewers that immediately following this panel, there's the closing ceremony of the Paris Peace Forum. I'd like to apologize for one of the viewers who asked a question in French, which I understood, but couldn't quite have the brain capacity to translate at the same time, and give the opportunity to any of our panelists for any final thoughts, comments, whether to the last question or others. The final floor is yours, Nanju. Sure. I just want to point out that, you know, uh, we're, we're in a new paradigm that's challenging these traditional roles of uh, government businesses, and especially in the digital dispensation. We're seeing that uh, especially big businesses are the ones uh, who are the architects of the digital age. They're the ones with the power, the resources, the innovations, research and development. And that's coming with a lot of power. So there is a moral obligation we need to start to speak to for them to voluntarily adhere to the conventions and rights frameworks that we already have in various countries countries to protect them for all people who are using their platforms and not just preserve, you know, observing particular rights, whether individual or groups uh, for particular corners of the world. I think there's an immoral imperative, even as we're trying to figure out what the guardrails um, or the regulations or the, or, or that will be uh, to govern this new paradigm and what each other's roles are, even as we talk about multi-stakeholderism. Thank you. 
so much, Nanjira. I think that gives you the last word. I'm so grateful for all our panelists um, for your thoughts on this. The timing is over, but Nanjira Sambuli, thank you so much. Latha Reddy, Latanya Sweeney, Craig Newmart, huge thanks on my side and uh, to all our viewers. And I really look forward to continuing this conversation with you offline. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a wonderful session. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.